Well, welcome everybody to uh, this evening's event, um, or indeed this afternoon or this morning's event, uh, because it, there are people who have registered pretty much from around the globe, from China uh, to the Americas. So um, I'm Robert Huxford, I'm director of the Urban Design Group, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, the first in a series of events that will explore the evolution of the city. It is being recorded, and the recording will be made available freely after the event. And this series begins today with the great and historic city of Aleppo. We will see in this series the differences between cities that reflect the cultures of the people who have lived in them over the centuries and millennia. But we will see similarities too, similarities that arise because of our underlying humanity. We all of us care for our families, our children, our parents, our relatives, and we all need homes that enable family life. We need to work and need workplaces. We need places to manufacture, to trade and to buy and to sell. We have friends and we need places to meet them. Uh, places of beauty. We need gardens and trees and water. We need places for worship, places to celebrate, places to rejoice and to mourn. And we can find all of these things in the world cities and without exception. And while we will see in these events differences, the underlying truth that will emerge is that the things that we share are far greater than the things that divide us. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome the speakers today and a Dr. Hussam al Weir, who will be giving the first presentation. Very good afternoon, everyone. I hope you hear me. Uh, a great pleasure to welcome all of you with this uh, international series on the evolution of the city. And we're starting with the great city of Aleppo. Uh, thank, on, on behalf of Urban Design Group, I would like to welcome the audience, but also our great speakers today. My name is Hussam Alwer. I'm a reader in University of Dundee and also part of the executive committee in Urban Design Group. So I will deliver the first talk on the evolution of the city, giving some historical background, how it evolved, and how it shapes over uh, centuries. And then we will move to Dr. Hala Aslan, Dr. Hala Aslan from Syria. She is expert in heritage, and she will talk about the souk, the historical markets of Aleppo. And then we will have a video from Dr. Ali Ismail. He is from the Agha Khan. He is working on a, a, a range of rehabilitation projects in key sites in Aleppo. So we will have a, a video showing a, a recent rehabilitation for Souk al sakati in Aleppo. Then we will move to Dr. Magda Sibli. From, uh, uh, from, uh, she is a reader uh, from Cardiff University. She is expert in hammams, public baths in the MENA region. She has done a lot of documentary studies on public baths over the last 20 years and specifically in relation to Aleppo and Damascus. And we will finish with the great project again by the Agha Khan, presented by Dr. Ali on, uh, on Khan Al-Harir, and then a small reflection for the way forward from Dr. Ali. And then we will finish with some q and A. I'm sure you, you may have realized it's very, uh, very intense program. Again, this is a starter for hopefully something bigger in relation to the series, but also in relation to Aleppo itself, as we have a lot of good ideas for the way forward. So allow me just to spend the next 20 minutes or so speaking about just some of the evolution, uh, the evolution of the city. Of course, I will agree with you when it's come to Aleppo and the history of Aleppo, you could really spend days and days. So all what I do, I will just give a snapshot, I, let us put it this way, some really headlines without going into the nitty gritty. But also I would like to thank, by the way, all those who contributed to, contributed to this event, including those who shared with us their idea, their thoughts, their maps, their images, and so forth. And again, a big thank you to Jacqueline and as well Connie and colleagues in Urban Design Group for giving us this opportunity. So when it's, when it's come to Aleppo, when you, when you want to talk about Aleppo, the first things we have to bear in, in mind, the importance of the silk routes, 
dated from the second century until the 14th uh, 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 the 14th century the, the the silk roots was really very key when it's come to the way it shapes the economy and the politics of Aleppo of course Aleppo one important factors uh, uh, contributed to the to the, the to the city itself and the way being shaped is the location uh, uh, through the silk routes but as you might be aware the silk route itself uh, has even evolved over over centuries the red line as you can see that's the land routes and the the, the red one is the, the 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 sea and the water routes and uh, and as you can see how it linked the china india Bergia, arabia egypt and even europe and as you can see syria especially damascus and aleppo is really at the heart of that Silk Route. So the location of Aleppo has a big, big, uh, is a big influence in a way it, it, it is being shaped. When it's come to Aleppo itself, Alep, uh, Aleppo in Arabic called Halab or Halab and Biora, in, uh, that's the Greek, that's the Greek name. It is really dated to the Hellenistic era. So I'm not going to focus on all civilizations, but I will fo focus on some of those. Uh, key factors. Halepo was really well known as a node of international and regional trade. So interestingly, its influence was beyond the geographical locations because it was a stretch, because it was really stretch between uh, Europe, uh, even Al-Hijaz, Iran, and India. And it has even uh, during Islam an important role to play in relation to the link with uh, Saudi Arabia, Medina, and 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 Mecca, but one thing as well to to appreciate about it, the city itself has been resilient and adaptable. In the sense, it has always been able to overcome the several several opposites of destruction through the long history, and that's destructions came from nature, earthquake, sometimes fire, but even conflicts and war. So the recent. The recent uh, uh, conflict we had in Syria is not a unique for a city like Aleppo. And I will show some an example how it has been really adaptable and resilient and how that's affected the urban morphology and urban structure of the city. Starting from the Hellenistic uh, grid itself, as you can see, this is the map for the city. Three key factors in this map is important to mention. To the left-hand side, the Quake River. The river itself was a, a key when it's come to the watering and water systems for the, the whole cities, including the public baths, which Magda is going to explain later on. Plus, beside the Quake, quake uh, River, there was an important uh, productive agriculture land, which really feed the city. As you can see, interestingly, Aleppo during the Greek era was really very similar to all architecture and urban morpho morphology of a Greek era. In the sense, it has citadel, acropoles, wall cities, plus as well the use of the grid structure. So a lot of historian architects managed to trace the original, uh, 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 the original grid structure, which was based on standard city block, insula, each 114 by 48 meters. So the dimension of the new city were only 500 meters north, south, and 780 e e e uh, east west. Thus, it's including only just about uh, 40 hectares. What was interesting, as you can see, there is a lot of main gates in Arabic called Bab, like Bab al Hadid, Bab al Nasr. Those the main gates surround uh, uh, located at the main wall of the city. As you can see, it's very defensive and being very fortunate with the with the with the citadel itself, which was four around four hundred fifty meter uh, meter uh, height, uh, comparing with the sea with the sea level. Interestingly, at that time there was no linkages or direct route between Bab and Takia to the left hand side. That's one of the main gate and the citadel itself. Interestingly as well, the city has got two walls. One, as you can see, uh, 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 overlap with the citadel, but when the city grow uh, during uh, Ottoman era, they move that wall and they create another one. 
This is exactly what the citadel uh, look like. By the way, why I am focusing on the citadel? Because Aleppo, especially the historical core, was regarded as two cities within one city. So interestingly, the citadel itself, where it is located, there it was inhabited by Thai people. There was a very famous temple. It's called the Temple of Weather God. That's a very famous god in, 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 in history of of Aleppo, there were hammams, there was, uh, there was even modern outdoor theater, which is, by the way, still exists up to now. So this is uh, the, 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 the citadel and the urban, the, just look how, uh, how sophisticated the urban morphology of the city itself. This is, by the way, an, uh, the uh, satellite image for, from 19, uh, 1930s. So just to recap, basically the citadel over history really play a big role when it's come to, it was a religious centers devoted for the storm god, as I mentioned earlier. And this is some of the uh, 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 recent photos, but this is basically before the war, let us put it this way, uh, the recent war. Now, moving, wow, well, moving to the Roman grid. One thing I found it really very interesting when it's come to the evolution of the cities, how it was built on the previous structure, previous power, previous civilization. So when the Roman came in, in, in power and, and, and with the prestige and influence of Aleppo uh, 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 regionally and uh, 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 beyond the, the, its region, the physical structure in the, endowed by its Greek and Roman rules. So basically what the Roman did, they upgraded that main axis which link Bab Antakia to the very left to the citadel, and they added two col 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 colonnades on each side. So two colonnades uh, added to the main axis, and that's become really the main spine of the city. It become really the main DNA of the city up to now, by the way. Just imagine from that era up to now, that's really the main central col colonnade axis and that's become the spine which, where everything's arrived to it. Let us put it this way, including other settlements. But during the Roman era as well, they, they, they use that, what, what I call it, the, the existing structures, the existing grid, and they start creating the Roman forum, which was the agora at that, at that time, and link it with the, what they call the citadel. At, the, at that time, it became the Jupiter temple. Uh, uh, an important element at that time. The forum was in a way or another, a house, a, a Roman uh, uh, shrine at that time, which really continues up to now. But even when Islams came in power, what they, what they have done, they kept that colonnade, which is part of the souks. I will say it later on. Could you please unmute yourself if you don't mind? So the forum itself, the Agora, over time, it became the place for the greater mosque. And beside the greater mosque, there was a church. And, and over time, that cathedral uh, converted into madrasa, which is a school to teach the Islamic Sharia and law. So this is one things we found it unique in the history of Aleppo, the continuity of use, adaptation and continuity of use. So from Agora, which was really a very important civic spaces and places. It become a massive courtyard as well, has a big role to play in the mosque itself. And look at the relationship between the souk itself and the mosque. This is just, uh, apologies, I can't go into the nitty gritty. This is just showing what happened exactly, what happened in the, in the, in the, uh, during the evolution process. Could you please, uh, could you please mute yourself? So this is the Byzantium layout. This is then how the greater mosque, mosque emerged on the back of that forum, the cathedral beside that greater mosque, and then how that's being converted into madrasa, which is the school. But even the colonnades, this is by the way, the main axis, the, the spine of, of, of uh, the evolution of colon colonnaded street from the Roman, even to medieval times, what was interesting here, we start seeing the infilling. So small shops with different sizes and geometry start emerging. 
And that's really become the main centrals and start dividing it into several parallel lanes. But what I found it interesting, how they kept the pedestrians uh, through that uh, arcades, but even services and accessibility by animals and now by, by cars. What, what, what make Aleppo distinct from all other cities? It was a network of souks. So other cities like Asfahan in Iran or Istanbul or Sana'a in Yemen, it was based on linear souk. You could see from those maps, the linearity. Meanwhile, in Aleppo, it was a really series of network of souks as well as you can see being shaped around the, the big, the greater mosque. This was the, similar to others, but others only based on linear souk, let us put it this way. And this is how just the, the shape of city then uh, 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 start emerging and evolve and evolve over era. And I am going to end back this one uh, over the time because with the prosperity and, uh, and as the city during the, the Islam, let us put it this way, become really a key core trading cities competing against Istanbul and Cairo. So imagine during, uh, during Ottoman era, especially, we start seeing at least the, the concept of Medina start really shaping and emerging with over two linear kilometers of, 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 of covered markets spread either side of the line of the original Roman axis. And that covers some 50 hectares. That has been one of the largest cover souk, by the way, way in the world. And the Medina itself com comprise a distinctive commercial urban centers, mixtures of souk, but Khans as well. The concept of Khans emerged at that time. And I will explain what that Khans mean, which has, by the way, even over century, different meanings because the meaning itself has evolved to suit different needs. So Khans at, at some point was, by the way, hotel. In Arabic, they call it at some point fundok. It's as well to, to host all the foreign uh, traders, especially the European one, it's to host them, basically. But over time, that's Khan beca be, uh, uh, become associated with a large courtyard complex, combining provision for storage for goods, but accommodation for merchants. So during the Ottoman era, we start seeing really massive explosions, let us put it this way, of Khan becoming part of that souk structure. In the map in front of you, you will see at least just between 1500 up to 1700, at least 17 Khans. And by the way, in the history, I, I read a story that Aleppo has at least uh, 45 Khans. So this is 17 of them, those, by the way, very famous in the history of the Khans. Why? Because some of those Khans hosted the consulate, the consulates of England, uh, uh, Venice, Netherlands, and France. And I will explain the reason for it. One of those largest Khan was Khan al Jumruk. The Khan spread over 6,200 square meters. That was the largest. And each Khan has got its own, own unique gate. Each gate normally has a different style and flavor, and some of them really driven by the uh, influence by European culture. So the Khan, over time, devoted to the wholesale trade. So that's another definition of the Khan, how it evolved with the presence of European community. It often included lodging and always had, as I said, a, 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 court, a courtyard. So this is some of the Khans, as I said, uh, earlier, and some of those, as you can see, some of those pictures. I, I, it took from me a while to get these pictures to the left. To le the left. I, I call this title foreigners. The presence of foreigners, you might tell me why European was, uh, 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 how European and their, uh, uh, their presence in Aleppo influenced the shape of, of the city. There was an, an, an important treaty, capitulations, it's called, between uh, uh, Mamluks and later the Ottoman and some uh, European state, namely, namely the Venice, Netherlands, England, and the France. So this is one of those treaty by the way. The treaty itself was, was created in order to protect the trading and interest 
of European communities and visitors, and they represent in, in, in Aleppo, including as well facilitating the role of the councillor, and also to, 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 to as well establish where the Europeans could, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could, uh, could live in, in Aleppo and also exempted from the tax, which called jizya for non-Muslim. So that's really quite important in the history of uh, Aleppo. And this is some of the pictures of the Khan. I repeat myself, the pictures in the middle is really very key because this is Khan al-Bunduqiyya. Al-Bunduqiyya, this is in Arabic, the translation of Venice. This is the uh, Venetians uh, presence in Aleppo in the late 16th century. If you look at the gate, this, the architectural style, it's exactly this, the one you see it in Venice. So, and this is some of the, the courtyard, and as you can see, ground floor where some, some making and sometimes some trading could happen. And the first floor is the, uh, uh, where some of the consulates uh, 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 settled or some foreigners settled as well there. If you look at this heated map, you see how the city really uh, evolved over time from Byzantium to uh, uh, Mamluk to uh, Ottoman era, and it was expanded be be beyond the city wall, the one you see it in the red, in the red la line, but really using the same concept and, and, and idea, this very informal, sophisticated urban morphology. But the souk itself, which was really very, look at the grid itself, which is not the case, outside the, the city wall was really core and up to now. And this is how the city shaped, as you can see, Ottoman era played a big role. All the orange color, as you can see, it's really built during the Ottoman uh, era. Not only that, so the, yes, the souk itself and the mosque has a big role to play, but also the city over time managed to to, 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 to bring a lot of institutional and constitutional buildings and they, and, and they really embodied them within this sophisticated structures. And, and some of those, especially the blue one, the hammams, the public passes, which Magda will, will explain and speak about uh, later on. Uh, one important thing I would like to mention when we, when, when it, when we, when we speak about urban, urban morphology, I, I thought I should put this two slides together before I finish off. Uh, uh, the, the, the hierarchy of the streets. If you go back here, if this is the souk, as you can see in, in, in the middle and the spine, there is kind of bare mobility, bare mobility. Because if everything's bare mobile, why? This area is public, so it is open and you could reach the souk and especially the greater mosque in a way or another from any point. But when it's come to the neighborhood level, when it's come to the neighborhood level, this is not the case. You will see here now, this is one of the neighborhood in the old city, two neighborhoods, by the way, those two images. You will see there is a hierarchy structure now for the streets. So there is a public, semi-public and private. And there is what I call it, Keoli D. Sachs concept here. So not all the routes are bearable here. This is to do with the privacy, even by the way, during the Roman era and during the Islamic era. So for example, you can't basically access the routes. As you can see, the one, for example, the binky color, yes, that's a semi-public. Then you go to the yellow one, that's becoming more or less a private areas. So this wasn't the case when you look at the, the, the hammams, the, sorry, the, the, the main souk itself. So the importance of the hierarchy, the hierarchy street and the hierarchy uh, or orders and how to keep privacy. And this is even being reflected in some of those. Now, I am going to finish off to say something. City like Aleppo has been adaptable, has been resilient. The last crisis we had over the last 10 years or, or so is really not new at all for the city. Always city like Aleppo introduce it itself in different way, always with, with its people, with its potential, with its location, always emerged to become a better city, a stronger cities, and always adopting urban morphology to suit the current needs politically, economically, and environmentally. Thank you very much, and apologies if I a bit run out of time. And now we will move to Dr. Uh, uh, Hala Aslan from Syria. She will speak about uh, uh, her expertise about the souk and historical market as well. 
Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Hussam for his great presentation. And I'm grateful to Urban Design Group for giving me this opportunity to speak about the old souks of Aleppo or historic markets of Aleppo. As we know now uh, that Aleppo uh, became the first Arab Ottoman state in 1516, and it was soon made uh, the capital of an immense uh, province. Aleppo also was transformed from a frontier city on the borders uh, of the Islamic lands to a distinctive uh, commercial urban center and souks, campaigned with the construction of uh, new khans and uh, caravanserais, quesarias, uh, etc. Many of these uh, buildings are uh, concent uh, concentrated in the central commercial area, generally know, uh, known as Souq Limdina, uh, which developed uh, around the Great uh, Mosque of Umayyad uh, and was expanded uh, on the two sides um, on the main access road linking Bab and Takia in the west to the citadel in the east. Major infrastructure uh, and the architectural project uh, were begun in the second half uh, of uh, the 16th century for khans and souks and also for mosques and uh, coffee houses. Actually, in the, uh, in the Al Medina areas, almost 16% of buildings date back uh, to the second half of the 16th century or maybe later. The old city of Aleppo was a vast workshop during this period. Large section uh, of the previous urban fabric was demolished. The construction of Souq Saqatiya in uh, 1574 and its uh, surra surrounding uh, and its uh, surrounding uh, markets and hand uh, was a direct result for this major uh, project. The commercial function of uh, souks uh, took a political role in uh, the mid-16th uh, century. Following the agreement of a privilege, uh, privilege, uh, privileges uh, signed between uh, King of France, François le Premier, and Ottoman Emperor Suleiman al Qanuni in uh, 1526, which gave access and privileges uh, to European countries uh, to uh, special accommodation facilities and tax reliefs in Aleppo. Uh, the merchants were allowed to reside in certain uh, khan, khans uh, that was uh, followed by uh, positioning uh, the Venetian, uh, British, Dutch and the French uh, consulate uh, and the trading offices within Souk's uh, area. The development uh, of the Orient trade uh, with Europe driven by uh, uh, driven the city econ uh, economic uh, demographic and urban growth uh, so that it became uh, the Ottoman em uh, Empire's uh, city, uh, third city after Istanbul and Cairo. So Sakatiya gained its uh, importance as uh, the entrance of uh, Khan uh, al-Jumruk Khan uh, which has 344 shops uh, where the consul of France resided and established the first French consulate in Aleppo. Uh, the state of Venice opened the consulate uh, in Khan al Nahasin. Uh, later in uh, 1583, uh, the British consul uh, Johann Bert, uh, followed by the Dutch uh, consul, uh, similar to uh, other councils, first uh, reside in Khan al Jumruk. The British consul shared his uh, living with his uh, merchants uh, in the same uh, Khan, taking some rooms uh, for uh, as a residence. Uh, Subsequently, uh, by the end of the uh, 19th uh, century, uh, a large part of Aleppo Khans has completely or partially uh, converted into houses for uh, foreign uh, councils. The beginning of the uh, 16th, uh, 16th century, the city occupied by uh, 240 hectares, and it has uh, continued to gain uh, new areas to reach about 370 hectares at the beginning of 19th century, which expanded the commercial activities into a prosperous uh, economic center, particularly with 45 specialized khan or caravanserai, or caravanserai uh, as we uh, call it now. 
Souk of Aleppo uh, are distinguished uh, for their speci uh, specialities. Each one uh, contains certain category in which gives, uh, it uh, gives uh, its uh, name to the souk. So we can find the souk of uh, jewelry, uh, robes, perfume, pharmacy, medicine, uh, help productions, uh, and um, maybe we can find uh, a special market for uh, women. Uh, it's known as uh, astonishing souk for women. as we hands of Aleppo. At that time, uh, Aleppo uh, enjoyed a period of great uh, prosperity. Uh, uh, its, um, its fame uh, was uh, international. Even the British writer William Shakespeare mentioned it in his play, The Tragedy of Macbeth in 1605. The early 20th century, the souks of Aleppo were conducted, uh, considered uh, the largest uh, covered, uh, covered souks in the world, containing uh, 120 souks with 6,000 shops. The city, uh, the ancient city of Aleppo was inscribed uh, on the World Heritage List in 1986. Unfortunately, since war started, started in 2011, a lot of uh, historic monuments uh, have been damaged and the souks, uh, the, uh, souks has been uh, burned down. 25% of the historic building are damaged, 40% are, uh, are partially uh, destroyed and many fragments has been, have been stolen. Uh, this destruction uh, was the motivation of UNESCO in uh, 2013 to classify the city as endangered uh, site on the uh, list of world heritage in danger. Later, uh, the UNESAT uh, with UNESCO's uh, experts uh, on cultural heritage in Syria have documented uh, a detailed uh, detail Tiled uh, list of uh, damage uh, at uh, 518 buildings. Among it, uh, uh, 56 uh, buildings completely destroyed. Uh, 80, about 82 uh, buildings are sev uh, severely damaged, and um, uh, uh, 270 uh, uh, moderately damaged. For the, uh, commer uh, uh, for the central commercial uh, zone, it was founded that 40% uh, of the structures in the zone had been uh, either lost or uh, severely damaged, uh, requiring either full or partial, uh, partial uh, reconstruction. After the crisis, uh, the Syrian government uh, set up the National uh, Higher Steering Committee for the reconstruction of the old city of Aleppo, headed by the Ministry of Culture and uh, represented by the General Directorate uh, of Antiquities and the Museum uh, and many other uh, ministers, uh, experts in the field of cultural heritage, uh, the Aga Khan Trust uh, for Culture, also uh, the NGO uh, Syrian Trust for Development and uh, representatives uh, of the local uh, community. Uh, this uh, steering committee worked on three uh, parallel tracks. Um, first, the urgent, in, uh, urgent interventions, uh, the needs uh, assessment, uh, assessments, the development of, the, uh, of a strategy for a recovery process of uh, Aleppo. It established a timeline uh, which consists uh, of three phases. 
the first was uh, on the short term uh, from 2018 to 2020. The second was um, uh, mid term uh, from 2020 to 20, uh, 2024. Uh, the third was uh, for long term 2025 uh, till 2034 and plus uh, for all the activities uh, to be uh, implemented. So it was uh, in this stage, it was necessary to start with a pilot project uh, through which the level of uh, coordination and management can, can be examined. So Sakatia was chosen for this uh, purpose, taking into consideration several uh, points. Uh, be before that, I must uh, mention that um, uh, they uh, uh, Aga Khan Trust, uh, uh, in coordination with um, Director General of uh, Antiquities and the Museum, conducted uh, an analysis of three areas within uh, the historic uh, city in 2017. Uh, these areas uh, are uh, the, cent uh, the central uh, commercial zone, the citadel, number two, the citadel and its surrounding, and uh, number three, uh, the residential, residential neighborhood of Bab al Ahmar and Darb al Bayada. So it was necessary to start with a pilot project through which the level of uh, coordination and uh, management can be examined. So Sakatia was chosen for this uh, purpose uh, in this place, uh, taking into consideration several points. Uh, first of all, its uh, central position within uh, the urban historic fabric and the commercial zone, which allows a balanced uh, extension of a future rehabilitation uh, projects. The second uh, point, uh, it was chosen for its function, uh, is uh, directly related with the daily uh, local needs of Aleppo inhabitants. Uh, the third uh, essential reason, it's uh, moderate rate of uh, damage, which uh, decreases the time needed for implementation. As already uh, mentioned, most of souks of Aleppo were high, highly uh, specialized and got its name from its uh, products. Therefore, Sukh Sakatiya had its uh, name from the plural of word Sakati into a uh, Aleppo uh, dialect, which means the sacrifice junk uh, dealer, uh, the person who works with uh, meat. Uh, this is as a part of intangible and tangible uh, heritage of uh, Aleppo souk. Uh, the name of uh, the market has been uh, associated uh, with the traditional uh, folks, food. Uh, also, this uh, souk is a part of uh, Ibrahim Khanzada Waqf uh, or uh, endowment, uh, as we all know. Uh, the souk extended, uh, I must explain um, the architectural side of uh, the souk. The souk extended east to west uh, with an axis about 100 meter in length and uh, 5 meter in uh, width. Uh, with uh, 50, uh, 53 commercial uh, shop. Uh, the souk is, uh, has uh, two uh, gates. The first uh, is the west gate uh, uh, towards Bab Antakya. Uh, the second uh, gate uh, leads to uh, Souk La Tarin. Rehabilitation project was uh, commenced by, uh, by uh, the documentation study in 2018, uh, which included historical and archival research, architectural survey, 3D modeling, photographing, etc. Uh, in, uh, the market, uh, depend, uh, in the market, uh, we found uh, a partial uh, destruction of some structural uh, elements. Uh, three of the domes uh, that uh, are covering the main pas uh, passage of the soup were affected uh, by uh, shells uh, and partially uh, destroyed. 
the western uh, gate uh, of the the entrance uh, of the souk uh, was heavily damaged, as you can uh, see. Uh, the vault, uh, the arch uh, of the entrance, and some uh, sections of its walls were uh, completely destroyed. Uh, also, we uh, find uh, another kind of uh, interventions uh, that date before 2011, uh, which have uh, caused the physical damage to the original traditional uh, building. Uh, I, I forget to say uh, that this long uh, net of uh, interconnected uh, markets uh, in Aleppo, uh, the whole area can be uh, uh, locked up uh, by a number of strategic gates, uh, and each souk uh, has uh, its own gates, so uh, that during the night uh, it could be uh, closed off from the rest of the city. Uh, so the markets were uh, one of the most uh, safe uh, places in the city. Uh, in return, uh, the wooden gates uh, of the souk were broken uh, down. After rehabilitation, they were uh, reinstalled uh, to their original uh, position. Uh, also, we must uh, say that uh, it, uh, that Syrian trust uh, for development in collaboration uh, with uh, Aleppo Governorate uh, and Chamber of Commerce uh, launched a, se a series of meetings with uh, shopkeepers to explain the project, listen to their uh, concerns uh, and needs, and accord uh, accordingly uh, assist uh, them to uh, restore their uh, shops. Uh, in another hand, it must be uh, said that uh, HBEAM, a historical building information uh, modeling, was used for the first time in uh, cultural heritage rehabilitation project in uh, Syria, as we see now. Uh, another or a principal uh, success factor of the project was the high quality of the restoration uh, study uh, that was prepared by uh, experienced specialists uh, who were all Syrians, uh, of course, under the uh, supervision of uh, Agha Khan Trust experts. We can confirm that uh, the project was uh, received uh, pos positively. Uh, and the local uh, community uh, and on uh, the uh, uh, by the local community and on the national level and give hope uh, in Syrian uh, capacity to rehabilitate and rebuild uh, their country after war. Uh, rehabilitation project uh, of Sukh Sakatiya has received an ICROM uh, Charija award, award uh, for best practice in cultural heritage, conservation, and management in Arab region 2020. Now, what we can learn from uh, Al Sakatiya rehabilitation project? Could we say uh, that the Sukh uh, Sakatiya project has uh, succeeded uh, to, uh, to in meeting its main uh, objective as a pilot project? Sukh Sakatiya has proved that uh, it's possible to uh, successfully conduct uh, medium-sized uh, and uh, low-budget uh, projects in uh, the short-term uh, phases. Once the co uh, coordination among the concerned stockholders uh, is uh, fully, uh, fully uh, efficient. Uh, also, uh, local community must be uh, involved and engaged in all uh, recovery process uh, phases. Uh, another point, the tangible and intangible heritage is still a source of pride of any Syrian. Uh, also, there uh, a Mm, there is a, um, uh, we can say that uh, there is a hope among many uh, experts uh, involved in the uh, process uh, that the outstanding universal values of the ancient city of Aleppo can be largely uh, con uh, recovered uh, in the next uh, decades or years. Uh, 
uh, uh, another positive uh, point, uh, po uh, point uh, that can uh, always be the main uh, motivator during this uh, process is uh, sharing values uh, the Alipians have uh, for their heritage. Finally, uh, I have a word to, uh, to say uh, that uh, we can consider, uh, consider uh, Syrian cultural heritage as a tool to promote uh, our national peace after uh, heritage and hope uh, peace will, uh, uh, will be in all uh, Syria. Thank you very much for uh, your listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hossam, uh, Urban Design Group, Dr. Majida, and Dr. Ali. Thank you very much. So thank you for Dr. Uh, Hala. Uh, as it stands, just uh, Dr. Ali from, uh, Dr. Ali Ismail from the Aga Khan in Syria has kindly shared with us a lovely movie, movie showing a, a very positive energy about the souk itself. So we're going to run the movie for two minutes before we move to Dr. Magda. And then of course we will finish with Dr. Ali and his message as well.
Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for sharing with us the Souk al sakatiya and uh, the great job the Aga Khan and other agencies and local people they, uh, done on the Souk itself. And uh, now uh, let us move to our third speaker, Dr. Magda Sibley. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will share my presentation. Thank you, Magda. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, happy to join this uh, fantastic event. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Urban Design Group and Dr. Hussein for organizing uh, such an important series about history of, uh, of cities and starting with Aleppo. Um, the presentations that um, preceded me uh, are extremely uh, informative in the way that the uh, city has got a very uh, deep uh, history uh, and the, the short film that was presented uh, was a, a breath of fresh air in terms of having some hope about reviving this uh, uh, absolutely wonderful city, which has got, I believe, uh, uh, the DNA of resilience, as uh, um, Jose mentioned it at the beginning, and as also Hela mentioned it, that the city has in the past seen so many uh, wars and disasters, and it has managed to, um, to bring life back and rebuilding from the past, uh, but also innovating the future. So I'm going to talk about hammams, which is a very, um, a very, um, very uh, uh, close topic to my heart because I grew up in Algiers and I used to go to the hammam with my grandmother. And uh, then I, I went to the UK in the 1980s to complete my uh, postgrad studies in architecture. And I, uh, all of a sudden, I was uh, taking students to do field work in uh, Morocco to start with. Uh, and I realized that hammams were um, very rarely presented as heritage, let alone protected. But also in books of architecture at the time, uh, there were not many examples that were documented. And so my passion started with um, looking at the hammams of Fez initially in 1999. I will not tell you how old I am, uh, but uh, then uh, I uh, uh, had, uh, that was initially funded by the Arts and Humanities uh, Research Board at the time. And then I had uh, a grant to look at the heritage hammams of Damascus and Aleppo in 2004. And very quickly uh, things uh, scaled up and I ended up having two EU projects. Um, and this uh, image shows the women on that EU project. Uh, and this is taken in Hammam Asilsi El Malik Zahar in, uh, in Damascus. Uh, and then we managed to revitalize also a small Hammam that was going to be closed and was a, a, an intervention, an urban intervention that acted as a catalyst for a revitalization of uh, the whole street where the hammam was located. And so my talk is uh, under the title of Hammams as Catalyst of Urban Sustainability. And I would like to uh, illustrate how this has been in the past and how this could continue in the future. As you know, and as has been uh, already demonstrated, the city, uh, historic cities, you know, have built, they never, uh, most of the time never just appear, but they build on the past. So they have been the hammams. Usually when I say hammam, most people will think about Turkish path. However, the hammams uh, started first in much earlier than the uh, Ottoman period. And here we have an example of transition uh, of Qusayr Amra, which is a small uh, desert castle or, or hammam in what is known today as the Jordanian desert. And it was uh, uh, built uh, as the, there was a lot of movement between Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Syria uh, as the capital of the Umayyad uh, uh, was in, in Damascus. And so these early transitions really um, were very important in the way that it, the institution of uh, uh, bathhouses was immediately absorbed and adapted and adopted by uh, the Islamic civilization. Uh, but it mainly developed from the small baths, the small Roman baths, not the very large ones. So the small baths known as, um, Thermia, uh, as Bania, the Thermia were the very large uh, baths. And 
such transition was, of course, um, dictated by uh, the uh, Islamic practices of uh, the ritual of uh, major ablution known as Ghusl, is that um, for, before praying, you have to have to take major ablutions or uh, minor ablutions. Major ablutions happen in certain uh, conditions. And so therefore, the, the, um, the, the absorption of uh, this institution into Islamic civilization uh, went very quickly when in the West, uh, public bathing tradition was dying. And so um, we, when they developed, what happened is that they're much smaller uh, to start with, and they have uh, let go of uh, big pools because the necessity to wash in Islam is to wash with running water. So no, no water was to be shared uh, with other people. And uh, because of um, their relationship to the act of praying, they are important urban facilities that you can find them usually in clusters, uh, but within walking distance from the souk or the mosque and within every single, um, single neighborhood. So this is an image which uh, two photos by uh, a French photographer, Pascal Meunier, who uh, documented, uh, did a documentary, a photographic documentary of hammams in the region. And this is on uh, Hammam Yelbura uh, Nasseri in Aleppo, which is at the base of the citadel. This is Hammam al muqaddam in Damascus. And what is very interesting is that in Islamic tradition, as I said, you wash with running water, but you are also covering your body uh, and there is uh, a semi-obscurity, which, uh, which combined with the steam uh, is creating um, a kind of visual privacy. So uh, there were codes of, uh, of course, behavior of using the public space and, and men and women use this hammams uh, at different times. And sometimes you have the hammam which has got the women's section and a men's section. So here we have, um, I documented the hammams of Damascus to start with in 2004 and then 2006, I was involved in an EU project as well, working on a number of hammams in Damascus. Uh, but uh, I also documented some of the hammams in uh, Aleppo. Uh, and I have also documented hammams in the whole of North Africa, historic cities. And that gives me uh, the opportunity to compare the types. And I can tell you that the hammams of Syria are absolutely amazing and very rich. They were documented in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, particularly uh, by Ekoshar and Locker in Damascus. Um, but they present a variety and an evolution of the type. Um, however, my talk is not going to be on the architecture of the hammams but, uh, in details, but it's going to be mainly on the hammams and the urban design and urban planning scale. And so their proximity here, we've got the Omeyyad Mosque in Damascus, and we have the Sukh also in Al Hamidiyah in Damascus. And within their proximity, there are quite a number of hammams which were still operating, and some of them are still operating today. Now, the talk that has been presented was uh, focusing on the uh, Sakatiya. Um, uh, the revitalization that we had first the history of the city and how it evolved from Hellenistic era to, to until today. Then we had a, a focus on the on the on the uh, the, 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 the central souks in Aleppo and their importance uh, as a vital it's as a, the economic um, um, heart of the city. And within that, uh, you have, of course, a number of hammams that are located in the, um, in the heart of or the souk of uh, Aleppo. I have located a number of them here, as you can see, and this uh, uh, based on uh, the work that was a paper that was published by Jean-Claude David and uh, Munif Hanif uh, uh, about the uh, hammams of Aleppo. And we can see, for example, here, the location of Hammam and Nahasin. And then Nahasin means the coppersmiths, and it's just next to uh, the Khan of Nahasin, which is the coppersmith Khan. What is important is that you can see that they are really well embedded in the urban fabric of the city. Uh, usually they are very well hidden. Uh, they do not display a very important uh, facade, and they have bent entrance 
and then you are in a very big uh, changing room which um, acts as uh, a kind of public space uh, in the city where particularly uh, for women when uh, for many centuries it was the only kind of public space or where women could meet from the same neighborhood. So um, the location of the Hammam, since it's about water and it's about heating the water, is highly um, uh, associated with the medieval water distribution system, which brought um, uh, canals and the ground canals from the river and distributed the water to major urban facilities. So the mosques have got uh, need water, the hammams need water, uh, the madrasas need water, and so uh, they're their clustering around water uh, was an important element in their location in the urban fabric. What is also important is we talk today about the 15 minute city, uh, walkable city, and these uh, important urban facilities were located in every single neighborhood and with walking distance from mosques um, and other clusters of facilities. Um, in addition to that, the hammams have uh, two entrances and two parts. One is the bathing part, and the other one is the um, service area for uh, and the technical area for heating. So the entrance to the hammam is always, you have two entrances, one for the clientele and one for, for uh, accessing and bringing fuel uh, to, the, um, to the furnace where the water is heated. So the hammam have got sometimes their own wells or they are connected to the system or they have they are uh, linked to springs. So in this map, we can see in red all the hammams of Aleppo that have been closed. This is based on uh, the Jean Claude uh, David uh, map that was established, I think, around 2008 and published 2014. Um, in uh, uh, and what we can see here is that the blue hammams are the ones which were still functioning in 2008. And of course, uh, we can see here different layers uh, of hammams. All these numbers are hammams. And we can see that uh, they are uh, the, the further away we go from the center and uh, the larger the number of hammams is uh, uh, closed or uh, disused. But what is interesting here is if you think about them as urban facilities, they also fo follow the hierarchy of the uh, city in terms of smaller hammam for neighborhoods and larger hammams for mosques and Friday mosques. Um, so uh, this is also in, in very important. And of course, the souks uh, have their own hammam. So if we look at, from the environmental point of view, we can see that the hammams are a, a way of sharing resources, sharing water and sharing uh, because the hammams were collected, connected to wells and at the time where um, the city evolved, not many houses had their own bathroom facilities. And as we see that hygiene is very uh, important uh, for uh, praying and part of the ritual, uh, the, pre -re the ritual before praying, you know, their, uh, their um, proximity to all the neighborhoods is very important. Now, they also act as a neighborhood magnet because uh, so they are also spaces which are not as one would think they are only for cleaning, but they are actually social interaction spaces and spaces for enhancing both physical and well, uh, mental well being. And we have been in a COVID situation where it has become more than evident to everybody that we are social human beings and we need social interactions for both uh, for our uh, mental well being. And with the hammam is also about sweating uh, and eliminating many toxins. So the hammam is known in Arabic as the silent doctor because it is good for treating depression, treating arth uh, arthritis or easing uh, uh, rheumatism uh, and also eliminating toxins and losing weight. So the other thing that is shared in the hammam is uh, uh, the hot water. So we are not here uh, with sustainable um, dimensions of urban design. We, for example, think about uh, district heating where the water is centrally heated and then distributed. Here it's the opposite, is the hammam acts as a central heating for the water, but it's people who would walk to it. So they would exercise, walk to it, meet each other 
and it's a, pl a place where both poor and rich, uh, young and uh, 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 old uh, would would meet, uh, and uh, they are all. Uh, it's a, a, a space which is very convivial, and it also marks a number of uh, important uh, moments in life, uh, and as we will see. Unfortunately, the Hammam as an institution has been in decline since the 19th, uh, 19th century, particularly with uh, modern ba bathroom facilities being introduced into um, the houses, contemporary houses. Uh, however, as I said before, the Hammam is not only about washing because you have the steam and you have the perspiration, you have the scrubbing and the removal of layers of skin that is dead. Uh, and then you have, of course, the social, economic, environmental functions. Uh, so they were usually very um, um, badly understood as, as uh, their role uh, as part of an important ecosystem of the Islamic city. And so they have uh, been removed or closed and they really never been considered as uh, an important heritage. So here I can illustrate, for example, the number of hammams that were functioning in 2008, according to Jean-Claude David. Uh, you have Hammam Garnata, which is from the 1950s, Sadat also around, around that time, Malaki Naim, Bab al Ahmar, Al Bayada, Hanano or Haddadin, Al Raqban, Salhiya, and Nahasin. Nahasin is the one in the in the Nahasin near the Nahasin Khan in the market. And we have also the kind of well-known Mamluk Hammam Yalbuga Nasri at the base of the uh, citadel and Hammam al-Jadid. Magda, uh, five minutes, Magda. Oh dear, oh dear. Okay, so we can see the decline of uh, numbers and we can see that uh, of the 12 Hammams that were still there, only three had their original state. Um, so we can see here uh, the location of Hammam and Nahasin, which is uh, next to the um, to the Khan and the Hasin is here and the Hammam is here. And this is a picture which I took in 2004 and you can see at the top here uh, saying Hammam and the Hasin and you go down a long corridor and then quite a number of uh, steps down, it's a number of meters. And sometimes the Hammams are well sunken in the ground because that helps in keeping the heat. There are important social uh, spaces. You can see myself here, much younger than, <laughs> with uh, my husband and daughter as we were uh, doing some work, uh, look, visiting the hammams, and this is Hammam uh, Nahasin in, uh, in Aleppo. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hussam was my uh, PhD student at the time. So uh, he, he also was helping me doing some of the field work. Uh, and we did field work uh, going around these hammams. This has been, of course, changed quite a lot, but uh, it's still an important social space. Uh, it was built before 1259, so it's Mamluk era, and it's uh, still one of the very important uh, hammams in Aleppo. It's a social space, uh, and this is a picture taken by Richard Boggs, uh, who has written a book called Hammaming in the Sham. Uh, his book was published in 2010, so it's probably um, around 2009 or eight that this picture was taken, you can see how, um, how um, lively the space is and how after the bath, this is a absolutely wonderful social space. You can see also the use of uh, traditional uh, towers that are used in the, in, made locally um, and the, um, uh, the uh, drinking and eating and praying that happens. Hamams, are a rite of passage that marks the passage from one social status to another, from childhood to death. So when a boy reaches the age of seven, he can't go to the hammam with his mom, he goes with his dad. And then uh, uh, marriage, uh, it's a, uh, you always have a party, pre-wedding parties taking, uh, taking place in the hammam. This is, these are, um, uh, there is a wedding party that was in hammam uh, al-Bayada, and uh, also the ritual of using henna and marking the passage to the hammam by the bride. Outside of the souk and at the base of the citadel, um, uh, Hussam and I were visiting this hammam again in April, 2004. At the time there were huge uh, parties in the changing room of hammam uh, Yelbura as there were about four or five um, brides having their hand party in the uh, changing room. It's one of the most beautiful hammam 
quite uh, large and you can see here the um, the cross shape organization of spaces and the beautiful uh, daylighting system um, that uh, comes from this uh, hammam. It was rehabilitated and there was an important uh, social space. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, the hammam has been uh, affected by the war and um, uh, partially demolished. And this is a photo which I took on the left here in 2004. This was taken by uh, Pascal Meunier. You can see uh, the um, monumental dimensions of this uh, hot room and the beautiful light that comes from the, the first domes um, with, um, with glass. Now, the other aspect which was uh, very quickly touched by my colleagues uh, is the waqf. Uh, this is another lesson of sustainability and resilience in, this, in the way that the hammam uh, was very um, a very um, a, a, a business that brought a lot of money. So many people would actually, or or dignitaries, or um, people in, in, with important political or uh, or um, army positions would actually uh, establish waqf, which is a, a religious endowment, uh, endowment which maintains the um, an institution or a building for the public good and maintains also um, the funding for, for the public good. So many work like hammam and shops were uh, endowments linked to mosques because uh, that was one way of uh, giving wealth to the city for uh, uh, charitable uh, acts that are going to be perpetuated for forever. So a work uh, uh, property normally is not uh, sold. It's, uh, for example, the hammam is rented to someone for a number of years and part of the proceeds will go towards the uh, uh, preventive conservation of, um, of mosques, madrasas, and so on. And so you can see that um, they were also a, a, an element of urban development. Uh, usually the, the mosque and the hammam were um, built to almost to, together because the hammam then gave um, the waqf system uh, resources to look after other buildings or even build other uh, buildings. And, you can imagine that in Damascus and Aleppo, we're talking about around 100 hammams in the city. So you have an example here of in Aleppo of uh, the mosque of Bahram Basha, which has got uh, its endowment, um, which is not only uh, for the um, for for the shops, uh, the, some of the shops are on the souk, but also for hammam, which is not necessarily uh, in the same neighborhood, but in another neighborhood. And then it even has uh, some work uh, properties in, in Cairo. So you can see that the work uh, was pro pro proliferated in the Ayub, in the um, in the period of the Mamluk, and uh, was also extended uh, in the period of the Ottomans. And unfortunately, that system was uh, made redundant uh, as this kind of uh, uh, clusters of facilities which depended. Uh, on each other economically for the public good uh, was then broken in the modern times. Um, and here we have uh, the Hammam uh, Barham Pasha, which is one of the largest, and um, it has got, as you can see here, a, um, a changing room that is, uh, no, it's here, the changing room is here, is one of the largest 200 square meters, which indicate that the changing room is an important social, public, semi-public or public so, social place indoors. It was operating until uh, 1979, but it was for sale 2010. I don't know what happened to it. And of course, with Hammam, you have intangible uh, heritage and local industries that are associated. So there is a whole ecosystem that is economically dependent. It employs people uh, uh, from the neighborhood who, ha who don't have uh, uh, advanced skills. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it is part of the living or part of the neighborhood uh, life for many uh, years and people establish a, a relationship from their childhood until uh, they, their death with the hammam that is in their neighborhood. So unfortunately, quite a number of hammams uh, here uh, are mentioned as being damaged by the war. And, um, but uh, I would like to finish on the fact that Aleppo's DNA is made of urban resilience. 
And here I like to show you the photo of a, a father and his child working on making the, uh, uh, the traditional soap of, uh, uh, of Aleppo, which is uh, uh, Sabun al Ghat. Uh, and uh, this is also a link to intangible heritage uh, and uh, made from uh, olives, this uh, and uh, lower um, uh, leaves, completely organic uh, soap. And uh, just to apologize if I went a little bit longer, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, you, Magda. Thank you. Thanks, Magda. Could you please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, this is really highly appreciated. Uh, uh, kindly today, uh, Dr. Ali shared with us a really lovely, lovely and nice surprise. And we thought we should share it with all of you, which again will give a lot of hope for the way forward for Syria and Aleppo post-war. So Dr. Ali, do you want to say something briefly about the Khan Al-Harir while I put the movie? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, UDG. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, yes, basically what I would like to say just before uh, showing the next uh, video clip about the work is that uh, all these works, uh, the projects that uh, you have already seen uh, done by the group here is actually a reflection of one word only, which is hope. And what we would like actually to uh, stress on is that from our perspective, hope is the magical word that actually is brought to us by the people who have, uh, as in the last slide of Dr. Magda is showing, is actually uh, a, that resilience is in the DNA of the Olympians in, in general, Syrians in specific, and that we are only trying to mimic uh, that by basically allowing as much as possible to happen on the ground. Uh, the projects that you have uh, seen, whether that's Saqatiya or now Khan Harir or later uh, the third and the fourth other projects, we are keeping them as a surprise for now, uh, are only uh, tools to be actually used for the benefit of those who are really interested to actually change their fate with their own hands, not to wait for uh, aid uh, from anybody. And uh, our motto has always been as the organization which is actually looking after uh, the protection of the World Heritage Sites in the Islamic world was actually help those who are mostly in need, but who are really uh, up to the, uh, uh, to the call by starting themselves even without waiting for others. So from that perspective, I think what's really important uh, is to reflect on, uh, after actually all the nice and very good presentations uh, presented by Dr. Hassan, Dr. Hala, and Dr. Magda, is to say that what we are trying to do is just to be at the service of uh, those who have decided to stay, who have decided to actually change the black picture, the big black picture. We know that actually uh, this is an enormous task. It's not something easy. Uh, as you remember, we are talking about the old city of Aleppo, uh, which is actually a vast uh, and the, the most ancient uh, uh, continuously inhabited city in the world. You're talking about a city where actually millions of people are still living until uh, this moment. We're talking about the old city of Aleppo, which actually the two thirds of the city is either uh, uh, destroyed or damaged. Uh, but at the same time, this is actually the black picture that everybody is seeing, whether, especially if you are from outside. But as, as I have actually been uh, very excited to show Dr. Hassan the other day, that there is another untold uh, uh, story uh, behind this darkness and that this story is actually written by the Olympians themselves who have decided not to wait and who have decided actually to take their fate with their own hands, who have decided to start putting these white dots in this black picture. Uh, and, and their motto is that it doesn't matter how small that white dot is, at the end of the day, for an external eye, it will always focus on that white dot. Uh, it doesn't matter how small uh, it is and that our mandate is to work together with everybody else who basically can basically focus uh, those white dots to be together as uh, much as possible, uh, surrounding themselves, uh, working within some of the extravagant, most difficult, challenging circumstances that you can ever hear about. Normally, uh, when actually any war is in, you see that there are several partners who are actually jumping for the help. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Syria. Uh, you actually, after any war, you see that there is a lot of uh, 
uh, resources from interested partners who are ready to be put there. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Syria. Imagine that we are actually struggling on a daily basis for the basic things, starting from finding fuel, finding electricity, or actually having electricity, uh, transportation, human resources, financial resources, not to forget all the external challenges, uh, which is actually impacting uh, the, the, uh, the improving or actually helping the people to get back or actually strengthening their resilience. But as I said, uh, for an external party, an external observer, uh, the black picture, which actually is always focused on, especially in the media, uh, we are actually uh, encouraged by those Olympians, the true Olympians who are actually there to change their faith. And uh, of course, uh, I am humbled here to be in uh, participating in this group, reading some of the name of the participants, because um, those who are actually dear friends, dear brothers and colleagues that we have worked earlier, previous to 2012, specifically, I would like here to actually highlight the efforts of Dr. Man Shibli, who used to be actually the mayor of Aleppo between the years 2008 until 2012. And from our perspective, uh, Aleppo is a city of uh, where actually it's like a hidden jewel. You can't basically see it from above. You have to live within, you have to see it from inside, you have actually to explore it. It's like, you know, a Pandora box when you open it, you have actually to go layer by layer. You can't just actually judge it by looking to pictures or reading articles or actually novels. Uh, some who would actually say, we know Aleppo from Agatha Christie novel. But uh, if that's the case, uh, then actually uh, that wouldn't be the, the reason why all of these uh, uh, Orientals or actually people who are from abroad decided to actually stay in Aleppo. Uh, as Dr. Hassan rightfully said that Aleppo uh, is a, a unique structure and uh, there is only one way to understand Aleppo, which is actually to visit it. So I will stop here and actually uh, invite Dr. Hassan just to show us the second video about uh, Khal Harid, because I know that some of you have actually thought that there is only one project, which is Souk uh, Sakatiya that we have completed. But uh, uh, I'm gladly and proudly uh, here to say, no, actually we have completed now two uh, projects, Souk Sakatiya, Souk Khal Harir. The third one is expected to be completed in the coming few days. The fourth one has been signed. A fifth one is actually under the study. And if this is actually all of that, it's because of the strong will by the Alipian to change the black into white. And I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank, Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Ali, and great to see such a lovely project. And uh, as you said, it's being completed and we really look forward to seeing the other ones, hopefully soon. Uh, okay, uh, Robert, uh, can we go to the Q&A now? Just to take some uh, quick questions, what do you think? Very good time to go to the Q&A. So can I suggest to people that they put their questions in, in the chat? And there's lots of subjects that could be addressed um, about souks, about uh, ways of funding restoration, how uh, maybe the hammams were, were operated, um, whether they were available free of charge or whether, whether there was a charge associated with them. Um, so do, do ask questions. And the more inventive the questions are, the better. Uh, uh, Magda, Magda, there was a question. Would you mind if you just say briefly, if you don't mind, from again, just if you just explain a little bit the concept of waqf, waqf itself. Waqf, waqf is a religious endowment. It's a religious endowment. It's called also habus. It actually, for example, someone who is wealthy and would like to do a charity which is going to continue after his or her death will actually... Um, uh, for, for example, build a hammam, and the hammam, uh, the, the hammam that is uh, is a waqf property that is linked to the mosque. So I will say, for example, that uh, uh, hammam Barham Basha is on the waqf of uh, the mosque of Barham Basha. So uh, if it's a private waqf, then it's uh, the proceeds of this waqf are going to continue first to uh, provide the facility of public bathing. So people do actually pay, uh, but usually it's a very affordable fee. And if people are poor, they can go and they are allowed to, to, to bathe without paying. Uh, but uh, um, the, it is a profitable business. So the, the building itself is uh, leased or rented to someone who would manage the whole, uh, the whole hammam. And you have whole families of hammam managers. So it's something that is inherited from father to son and so on. Uh, and then so this proceeds part, a proportion of it will go towards the waqf uh, of the mosque, which means that it can help with uh, construction uh, and maintenance of the, the building or with the running of the madrasa theological college, or sometimes even uh, with uh, uh, investing in uh, uh, sites which are well uh, in, in other areas like in Cairo or in uh, in the Holy Lands in uh, Saudi Arabia. In Thank you, Holy Magda. Lands. Thank you. And just to, to mention as well, I should have mentioned the Khan and the Souq, I explain in my presentation as well. Uh, how can I say they are way, uh, owned by the state and they using the and they use the endowment and the waqf to look after those, the Souq and the Khan as well, plus to deal with emergency in terms of the, if there was any earthquake or any attack. So what I am trying to say, the waqf as well was used for maintenance and management of the city and its local assets from hammams to souq and others. There is a question for Dr. Ali in relation to the rehabilitation projects presented. Were original stones reused and were there a need for a new stones? Dr. Ali. Uh, well, basically, before starting, uh, there has been actually a careful filtering for all the conditions of all the uh, available stones. As you can imagine, most of the places have been actually damaged by explosions and later on by fire. So we were actually uh, just uh, launching um, a, a process by which we can identify those who, uh, uh, stones that could be reused. And when there is not possible actually to uh, replace them, uh, with the same uh, type of stones coming from the same uh, uh, places. So uh, uh, the, the, the level of destruction in Aleppo and the old city of Aleppo would require definitely actually to use whatever materials uh, available starting from the original stones and when it was not possible to actually replace it with an identical one. Uh, Dr. Ali, since you are on the site, I'm not sure whether Hala with us as well, so both of you might do double act. Are there enough skilled craftsmen for the overwhelming task of, of recovery, the old cities? And I know you've got a lovely story to, to tell about the training and skills as well. 
Uh, well, basically, um, a short uh, answer is no. But having said that, uh, that doesn't mean that actually we are standing still. On the contrary, just before uh, be standing or before starting any projects, the first thing that we have been actually trying to do is to building capacity within the young generations, uh, especially those who are actually uh, badly needed. Uh, let's not forget, when we are talking about the old city of Aleppo, this is actually a, a city that has been built by stones. And stone mason masters is those who are actually in badly need. Unfortunately, during the time of the war, uh, the majority, if not all of them, has actually left the city because those, who, uh, those type of, of uh, uh, professional would basically uh, earn their money week by week and they could not be actually just uh, waiting for uh, uh, years uh, for uh, a war to end. So we started actually in collaboration with a lot of parties, UNESCO, STD, the uh, Directorate of Antiquities, etc., by identifying uh, the group of, uh, let's say, individuals who are interested to be stone mason masters, and later on to uh, be the trainers uh, for trainers. Late. And that has helped us a lot, because when we started, there was uh, almost none. And right now we are talking about at least uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, workshops that has started actually after uh, that training. Another two questions as well, combined, let us put it this way. Before the war, were any of the buildings in Aleppo captured using digital surveying? That's one. But I would like to add to it, was there any opportunity to undertake more archaeological research before, during reconstruction? And if so, was anything about ancient city rediscovered? Okay, let me start actually by the first question by saying that uh, before the war, uh, uh, it was actually very hard and it was still very new to have this kind of technology be used. So with the exception of uh, two buildings that uh, we have been engaged in actually uh, surveying them digitally, which is the new Sarai, which unfortunately has been completely destroyed, in addition to the Hammam Yelbuka. Those are the two buildings that uh, we have worked on actually surveying. Now for the excavation uh, on the sites before we start, this is actually part of the collaboration with the Directorate of Antiquities by which uh, before we start, there is actually uh, a group or committees from the antiquities who are participating uh, in uh, checking uh, all the sites where we are working. And uh, when we receive uh, a, the green light to go ahead after they finish, we start. So the answer is yes. Excellent. Uh, another question for Magda. Magda, uh, just uh, were there any specific times allowed for use by men? and used by women and used by children, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, hammams usually, uh, when, it's a, a, when it's a single structure, usually operate for men and women at different times. So part of the morning, for example, is for men, late at night is for men, and during the uh, late afternoon until uh, sunset is for women, for example. But some hammams are, are uh, twin hammams. Uh, then the, we find these twin hammams a lot in, uh, uh, Istanbul, uh, and uh, but we uh, there are two twin hammams, but they are not. Is uh, the one in um, Hammam Souk, uh, Hammam uh, uh, Hassin, and the Hammam. Uh, um, uh, there is another Hammam as well. It's a, it's a double one, but they have only one entrance, so it's not quite sure how they manage the changing room. Uh, but um, the the question is, uh, children go with their pair with their mouth mom and while well, they are, are still young age, when they reach the age of seven, they go to the hammam with their father. So men and women have different times of uh, uh, attending the hammam. Some, some uh, hammams are only for men. For example, hammam souk, because most of the shopkeepers and the workers in the khans and so on would be men. Uh, and so um, initially or uh, originally, um, so the, it is mainly for uh, the uh, men. And some hammams still also operate, like neighborhood hammams can also operate for women only. Thank you, Magda. There was a question to myself about the street patterns 
the grid patterns I, I referred to earlier, which was used in the central of the historical cities, the, 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 the souk, whether that was extended beyond even in the suburbia, the answers is interestingly, no. The only, that grid was only dominated the, the, the main Medina, the main souk, and beyond that, especially when it's come to the neighborhoods, it was really just a range of informal clusters. So the grid was only central at the heart, which link the Antakia, Antakia main door or bab with the citadel uh, since the Hellenistic era and uh, up to now. Apart from that, it was really very, very informal, so sophisticated urban, urban morphology. I'm just checking the questions, apologies. Uh, there was an interesting question about the role of local communities in the rehabilitation and the restoration process for the two examples presented by uh, uh, Hala and Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, do you want to say something more about the role of local communities, but even lo the local shop owners? <laughs> Uh, does that mean that we are going to say everything on, on today's session, <laughs> not leaving anything for the coming session? Um, well, as a short answer, yes. There is actually um, the uh, approach that has been adopted is to engage all the key stakeholders. So basically when I say we, that does not mean uh, we as a group. It means actually all the key stakeholders who have participated in deciding uh, or actually discussing all aspects of this project, whether that's socially, economically, historically, etc., each in its actually own uh, criteria of uh, expertise. So yes, uh, and uh, uh, for the coming sessions, we can show some pictures that shows uh, very interesting uh, participation. I can actually tell you, but I'm not, I'm not going to show you the picture right now, but I can tell you. Uh, imagine that uh, uh, the, the, the people of Aleppo has been very enthusiastic so each would actually participate in different uh, uh, perspective. Uh, you, so for us, it was very normal, uh, sorry, it was very unusual uh, to find out that even children have expressed a lot of interest in coming and visiting the site, seeing actually more, uh, asking to have more uh, about uh, uh, the traditional craftsmanship. Uh, not to forget that even within the, uh, the, 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 our staff themselves, and the rest of the group, they have always been very active in uh, communicating uh, with uh, the, the rest of the key stakeholders, especially the shopkeepers, because basically the shopkeepers is our compass uh, uh, primarily in that area by which it would identify what are actually the priorities and we move from there. So I, as I said, in short answer, yes, but I'm leaving more explanation for coming sessions. No worries, thank you very much. Uh, Magda, it seems people are really interested with the subject of waqf itself. Uh, mm -hmm. There was questions, how, when, and why did the waqf system stop functioning? Mm. Okay, the waqf system uh, stopped functioning usually with the Tanzimat during the Ottoman period with the introduction of the Tanzimat where there was modernization or what is called modernization of uh, institutions. So. Um, you, you still have until today uh, the uh, ministries of waqf in uh, all the countries, uh, whether it's uh, in, uh, in, in Syria or in Tunisia or in Algeria or Morocco or, or in Turkey. Uh, so you still have uh, a ministry of waqf which, is, um, which owns quite a large number of the historic buildings. But the system of financing through the waqf is, is, is not... Um, it has not been, uh, how can I say, has been abandoned with modernization. And so uh, where, where uh, at the end of the Ottoman Empire, you know, the, the, the whole system kind of collapsed and um, therefore the, um, the kind of uh, um, decentralized system of looking uh, of work properties so that there is a continuity of, uh, protection and, and maintenance and operation of uh, facilities as, and uh, some kind of economic sustainability for doing so was uh, interrupted. Uh, so, yeah, so that's Thank how- Thank you, Magdi. There was an interesting question to do with, was the urban morphology in old Aleppo city 
within its souks, Han, Hammams, and others blend centrally or devolve in ad hoc slash informal way? The answer for it, as I said earlier, it really follow, you could see kind of a very military approach at that time. In Greek era, Roman era, it's all about creating defensive cities with that wall, citadel at the center, and that's uh, accessible uh, routes. So it, you could say, yes, to me, the way I see it, it really was bland centrally around that grid, but over the time, over the time, you could say it's really all, uh, it become kind of informal, especially when you start moving from the uh, very centralized uh, bland system to kind of uh, informal, especially in relation to the neighborhood. There was a questions about, there was if a question. I may just yes, say, Mada. add something to that. Uh, for example, in Aleppo during the Ottoman period, you know, the in the 16th century, uh, some of the buildings were actually designed by, uh, like the mosque of Adliya was designed by uh, Sinan. Uh, the famous uh, Ottoman architect Sinan. So, so some of the designs, the initial designs of mo mosques and things were actually centralized, but uh, slowly there were other uh, um, like uh, important uh, urban facilities, uh, like religious facilities, but for the residential facilities, um, they were um, done locally uh, and so have got more of the ca local characteristics of uh, uh, Alepian architecture. Sure. Uh, we'll take the final questions, if I may say, Robert, before we finish, what do you think? Are you okay with that? Absolutely. So the final one, uh, maybe Dr. Ali might be might answer it. Are there similar recovery activities in residential neighborhood in the old city? Or is it only really at this stage to do with the historical core, which is mainly dominated by the historical souk and shops? For the time being, and after actually a long discussion, uh, the uh, priority has been identified by the community themselves. So we are not the one who actually deciding on what is the priority for the time being. It took us almost like uh, a year in intense discussion with all key stakeholders before identifying where is the priority area. Let's not forget that this is not a usual case. Uh, this is actually a case by which resources uh, is not available. International partners are not available. Resource, uh, human resources are very scarce. So you need to start from somewhere and adopt the snowball approach because this is a huge task. You are not talking about a couple of buildings. You're talking about a city, which is almost uh, two thirds of it has been impacted negatively because of the war. So, uh, the, the option was actually not to wait until uh, everything or actually interested partners or resources would be available and start with acupuncture, uh, carefully selected, agreed project uh, in a common manner. Uh, and uh, this priority has been, as I said, discussed for almost a year. And we started where everybody or the majority has agreed to start uh, uh, from. And that is actually the old city of Aleppo. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. I, I know there are really uh, in the chat a lot of lovely photos, uh, photo, uh, not photos, a lot of fantastic questions, but uh, I'm conscious of the time and we really run out of time. Just before we, we finish, a uh, couple of things. Uh, firstly, on behalf of Urban Design Group and all collaborators, I would like to thank all our speakers for the fantastic, really, materials, resources, narrative they shared with us, from Dr. Ali to Dr. Hala, Dr. Magda as well, really your involvement being highly appreciated. Uh, that's one thing. Our second event as part of this series will take place on the 9th of September. That's Thursday, the 9th of September, five o'clock UK time. And it will be about the Gulf, Gulf area. Uh, and we that will feature Professor Ashraf Salama from Strathclyde University, and we will get in touch and we will send you all the details. And surely this is not going to be, just take it from me, this is not going to be the last event about Aleppo. We will liaise with our speakers, we will liaise with our partners and colleagues, and we will have another one because we, Syria and Aleppo deserve more than that, actually. And again, thank you very much for my colleagues in Urban Design Group, 
especially Jacqueline, Connie, and Robert for the time, energy, and the thoughts they have put into this because I know it wasn't an easy one. But once again, thanks everyone and thanks for the speakers and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. A pleasure. Bye. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you all. Thank you.